very, I had this nice teacher, Krishnamurti, uh, with whom I read the Laghumanjusha. And uh, he spoke Tamil, I spoke no Tamil. He did not speak Hindi and he know no English. So the only language we had in common was Sanskrit. And that, that really helps. So uh, for the audience, I'll just uh, briefly tell about Professor Tiwari again. Uh, he uh, joined as a lecturer in uh, Patna University in 1955. And then in, 19, in the middle of uh, 60s, that is in 64, he went to the US as a Fulbright scholar. And he did, did his AMA, I think uh, you would know more. And yeah. he did his PhD under you and his topic was uh, Panini's description of uh, Sanskrit Compound. nominal compounds. Right. And I know you are an expert of that. You are an expert of Panini and Katyayan and uh, Patanjali and their grammar, grammar system and all that. And then after that, he came back and he, uh, of course, worked in uh, Patna University up to say uh, the middle, uh, uh, you know, uh, late eighties, I think, uh, exact year, I don't know, but uh, after he retired from here, uh, he completed his term here. He was appointed as a professor at, uh, in the Republic of Yemen. And yes. he, worked, he worked there uh, for 20 years. And he must have come back by 2011 or 12, if I recall. Mm -hmm. I remained in touch with him my personal association was as strong and he guy asked me to uh, do writing and he said why don't you become a wikipedia editor and you writer then i started writing for wikipedia i wrote uh, the article on my college here patna college and then i also wrote an article on him and uh, my village and so many other things anyway so all this uh, happened and then uh, uh, gradually i also observed that he had become interested in poetry and he showed me quite a couple of uh, his poems oh. which i uh, you know made a for which i made a blog for him and also for many of his published and unpublished articles so i was quite in touch in 2019 i had uh, interviewed him in a series of telephonic conversations which i had recorded also and i you know uh, came to know about his life, about his, uh, about his growth as a student, as a teacher, and all that. Uh, and I have a plan to uh, write a series of such conversations. One I have already shared on Facebook and uh, I, I'm writing as blogs. And uh, so and that is all. Uh, I was in touch with him. Uh, off late, he was uh, uh, not feeling well, and you already know that. So, uh, of course, in April, he passed away. And uh, so here we are, I think, with you being there. Uh, now, uh, I would like uh, to introduce you also. You yourself uh, started uh, working in the early 60s, I think. No, sorry, in the 50s. In 61, 62, I have read about you that you visited Gujarat and you uh, started learning Gujarati. Yes. And you are also an expert of Gujarati and you are an mem honorary member of Gujarati Sahitya Parishad. Sahitya Parishad, yes. <laughs> and and uh, you did, uh, of course, learn uh, Sanskrit and Gujarati and so many other languages. You also taught Hindi in the University of Pennsylvania, one of the Ivy League universities, as we know. And uh, you uh, have, uh, uh, of course, written a large number of books and you are one of the leading eminent Indologists I know. And uh, the more I spoke, the less it would be, the list would be quite long. But the last uh, that I would like to conclude with would be the, uh, you have got a lot of uh, badges and recognitions uh, to your uh, credit. But the last one is in uh, 2016, about which I must mention the Indian Council of Cultural Relations had the uh, uh, recognized you as one of the two Sanskrit scholars uh, from outside India. Uh, and yes. one of them is you. Uh, in 2016, you are an expert of Vedas. And uh, I think uh, now the stage would be yours 
in which you would uh, share your association with professor tiwari you you will reminisce about him also you would uh, share uh, your experiences of learning hindi english uh, sorry hindi sanskrit and we would like to listen from you some of the sanskrit shlokas i think uh, if you can uh, it will be my request and so uh, that is all from my side so it, the stage would be right now yours after that uh, pramod uh, mishra will speak and we'll ask you a little more a few more questions okay well uh, traditionally before reciting that that astadhyay you have to recite three mangal shlokas they go like this ye nakshara samanna yamadhigam yamaheshwarat कृत्सं व्याकरण प्रोक्त तस्म पाणीन ये नम ये नौता गिरह पुंसा विमल शब्दवारी तमश्चाज भिन्न तस्म पाणीन ये नम वाक्यकार वर रुचि भाष्यकार पतंजलि पाणी सूत्रकार pranatosmi munitrayam those are the three shlokas that you traditionally recite before you go on to recite the entire ashtadhyay panini is ashtadhyas yes so, you know i i i had to memorize a great deal of it because otherwise you can't have discussions with pandits because they are re- they are reciting them at you <laughs> So you also have to be a pandit because the one who is a scholar of Sanskrit is called is addressed as a pandit only. Well, I don't know if I, if I qualify for being a, a pandit. I may I may not be learned enough. But no, we're talking about Tiwari. Yeah, Tiwari came to the University of Pennsylvania, I think, in 1964. Yes, I'm not certain. No, no, you are you are right, sir. And. Uh, he he did some work with me in classes not too much he did his master's degree under a, a colleague of mine henry hernixwald and what he did was to do a comparative phonology of uh avestan in iranian the language of the parsis and uh sanskrit then uh he he came and started working with me and he was interested in linguistic theory and you have to understand that in the 1960s linguistics was undergoing something of a revolution uh it was uh, the the chomsky and era had begun so there was an interest in formal grammar tg grammar excuse me transformational grammar transformational generative grammar yes but uh there was an interest then in formal grammars in general you have to understand that it was not just chomsky chomsky was a student of zelig harris who was a professor at the university of pennsylvania Ch- chomsky got his deg- his degree from the university of pennsylvania then he went to mit he was a student there he was a student of i didn't know him he was long before my era i arrived at the uh, at the university of pennsylvania in 1960 as a very young man i was 24 years old so in in 1964 when i was only 28 divari came i didn't know that he was older than me he always treated me as a teacher <laughs> and i treated him as a student and it was only much later that i learned that he was 5 or 6 years older than me and after he finished his degree i said to him tiwari ji why don't you call me george he says oh no sir you are my teacher i cannot do that so he never called me by my first name to his dying day i was yeah. his guru and i was always supposed to be called by my last name and when he wrote to me every letter began pranam and then he would tell me things so he was very respectful uh he was very bright i knew that from the beginning so we got into discussions and 
to understand why his dissertation was important, I don't know that many people are aware of how important this sort of work was. You see, in, in linguistics until, until, the, until very recently, you had this, what I call the building block theory. You had phonology and then you had morphology and then you had syntax at the top. So you took Sem morphemes and you put morphemes together to form sentences. No, no semantics. Oh, no, no. Semantics was an interpretive semantics that you then came after you've generated your strings, you then interpret. So I said, Tivari, are you aware that the Indian tradition is totally different? that Panini begins with semantics, begins with meaning, that the entire generative procedure begins what, what in Sanskrit is called vivaksha. Vivaksha kinchit vaktu michati. He wants to say something and therefore he forms an utterance. Now, this is the basis of how the grammar works. So the very first thing is to form a string so now the aim of the grammar is to form what is in Sanskrit is called a laukika vakya, a laukik vakya, a, a, a vakya that is used in the everyday communication. Now for the purposes of that, you form what is called an alokika vakya, a, an artificial posited, it's kalpana, kalpana. It's kalpanikam, it's it's a su it's posited it's uh, fictitious, and uh, they they had to form certain formal techniques of how to how to operate the grammar. This was totally new to him. I said, now the thing about it is, you see that generally people uh, I don't know if you've read his dissertation. In, in I have not read, but that has been published in the form of a book. I know. Oh yes, yes. It, he doesn't, he, it, it's interesting that he doesn't mention that it was his dissertation. He was that way, he was very really unassuming, I think. Huh? He was quite unassuming. No, no, it's not that. Uh, in, in India, for some time, it was forbidden to mention that your work was done outside the country. So it was, he was not allowed to say, this was, this was my doctoral dissertation at this university. My internet connection, for some reason, he says is unstable. No, but I, I think you're clear and your voice okay, is audible, fine. no problem. So then uh, we got together and I said to him, well, you realize that instead of taking independent words and putting them together, the, the, the way of forming compounds according to the Paninian system is that you take a vakya and you take padas within the vakya and you combine them under certain conditions. That is, you start with the syntax. And the syntax determines what the relationship among these consist uh, the words of, of compounds I... is. Hmm? No, yes, sir. Carry on. Carry on. Sorry. OK. Uh, so he did that. And we had some very interesting discussions. For... And he finished his degree in 1968. And he used to come to my house every week and he'd play with my children. I had very small children then. Uh, my older son was born in 1960 and my younger son was born in 1964. So he used to come to our house and play with them and play marbles with them. He'd get on the floor with my children. Uh, so it was, very, it was very nice. It was very a close relationship. And uh, when he finally finished his degree and he went back to India and we, we didn't, we were not in contact then for a long time because he went, I mean, he would write to me occasionally, both from India and from Yemen after he went there. But then uh, in 62, 63, I lived in India and in 65, 66, I was there again. And then from the early 70s, again, I used to go every year to, to work with uh, Raghunath Sharma until he died. And uh, 
we kept in touch that way. And he was very helpful to me. Not only did he visit me in Chata, and, and, and we, we talked then, but uh, he visited me in Varanasi also when I was with my wife. And uh, one time I was working on a critical edition of a Sanskrit text, the Parama Langhuman Yusha, it's called. And there were three manuscripts in the Patna University Library. And you know, the, you know the system in India. It would be very hard to penetrate the library system. But he helped me. He, he took me and he took me to the office of the director of the library, who was very standoffish at first. And, but then finally Tiwari said to him he could speak to me in Hindi and then everything thing started going all right. So he helped me get these manuscripts from, from the uh, Patna University Library, which was very helpful. And we, we remained in contact for some time after that. Uh, I don't remember the last time I saw him personally. I think it was in the mid 70s. But uh, then we lost touch. And it was, I actually remained in closer contact with one of his students, uh, Girir uh, Jha. Girir Jha. Who's professor of Sanskrit at Patna University, who was professor at Sanskrit, and who considered me his, uh, his teacher because I was. Tiwari's teacher and he was Tiwari's student. Mm -hmm. But in any case, uh, we lost touch. And then about three and a half years ago, I received a message, maybe it was from you, that said, Professor Tiwari would like to be, get in touch with you. Yeah. And I said, fine, here's my telephone number. And finally he called me. And you, uh, you placed the call, you say. And uh, we spoke for about almost 30 minutes. We spoke for a long time. And I said to my wife afterwards, I said, Tiwari ji is not well. He is about to die. I have this feeling that this is his farewell. That he's saying goodbye to me. Uh, he lasted a couple of years more. But I got the impression that he was, he was doing his, uh, uh, his farewells. But it was very nice to talk to him. I was very happy. When I was in, in uh, Patna, when I visited, I visited his, his home only once. Uh, he was very shy about having people. I think he felt that it was too modest. He, he arranged for me to stay at the home of one of his friends who was very wealthy, a wealthy landowner. And uh, I mean, I, you know, what am I, I accepted the hospitality obviously, and they were very nice. And uh, they accompanied me and my wife to Nalanda. We took a trip and it was very nice. Uh, so all in all, uh, my relations with him were first as a teacher, then as a friend for a long time, uh, and we remain never really that close because he always viewed me as a teacher. He never viewed me as truly as, as, a, as a, uh, a friend. We, we were friends, but only as teacher and student. He was very shy about that. And he was very modest about his own work. Very true. He didn't, he didn't uh, tell you what he was doing and anything like that. Uh, but uh, I did get to know some of what he did. But that's, those are my, my, my reminiscences of him. Uh, I would emphasize that his, 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 um, his doctoral dissertation is important. It's never, it's hardly ever mentioned. Uh, I don't see it mentioned in the secondary literature, 
uh, and it should be. And I don't know how, how much he was recognized within the academic in India. I, Indian academics can be very parochial from area to area. I know that because I, as I said, I, I worked in the Gujarat, I worked also in Varanasi. I have been visiting professor at, uh, in Pune. I was visiting professor in Hyderabad. I was visiting professor in Trivandrum. And each place is very, very insular, let's say. They're very closed. They're not very open to the outside. They're very protective of we're better than you or that sort of thing. So uh, it, it, it's hard. It, well, let's put it this way. I have always felt more at ease in interacting with traditional pundits, whether in, in Varanasi, in uh, Baroda, in uh, Trivandrum, in Tirupati, wherever it is, than with other scholars. Uh, there, there's a, I, have a, I have a greater affinity with them. And they're more open to uh, to somebody because what what they one of them actually once told me what counts is vidya that's all that counts where you are from or the you lecha or anything like that doesn't really matter to me as long as we can uh, communicate about science learning and argue on that on those on those grounds. Uh, and so with, with Tivari, uh, I, I would leave it at that. Uh, I, 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 was, I had great respect for him and uh, great affection for him from the way he, he dealt, he interacted with my family. It was very nice. He, he came in and he, as I said, he interacted with my children. Uh, it was very good to my wife. So uh, I have very fond memories of him. And uh, right, sir. Like so I think uh, you have, uh, I think uh, being aware and being acquainted with the Indian traditional uh, system of education, uh, who would know better than you about uh, the, you know, the kind of system that we have. And I did not uh, dwell more on that. Uh, yes, uh, I do feel that uh, Professor Tiwari should have got more recognition. Uh, but at the same time, I feel that uh, the, um, the kind of teacher that he was in the classroom, otherwise he remains in the heart of his students and lot many students have of his who, uh, who are now in their 60s now, like me uh -huh. and others. They do remember him very fondly and they have appreciated my efforts of reaching out to you or to of my of the efforts of my writing about him and all such things. So uh, there would be many others who uh, would like to share and all that. So right now, then after uh, you, you have finished, I would like... Uh, I am finished. Uh, right. I would like uh, Professor Mishra to speak a uh, few words and then uh, Professor uh, the Tarun Kumar and then we'll, we'll have some questions uh, that will be uh, directed to you. So Professor Mishra will speak. Thank you, Ranji. Um, I already have uh, a number of questions that I would like to ask uh, uh, Professor Cardona, but uh, that I uh, will wait uh, a little bit. Uh, well, thank you, Orenji, for arranging this. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to pay tribute to uh, Professor Tiwari. Um, when Arunji and I were at Patna University uh, doing our master's in English, um, I was also from uh, a rural hinterland in Nepal. So everything was new for me. Patna for me, Patna University for me was my uh, Oxbridge and Ivy League, um, because that was the highest, the most prestigious 
uh, university that I could go to. And I was there and I was very happy, happy about it. Uh, so when, we got, when I got there, uh, got there from a provincial, uh, a college from a, 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 from a provincial uh, area region in Bihar, which was Bhagalpur. Uh, it was a cosmopolitan place for me, Patna University was, because uh, there were professors who taught there who had degrees from overseas, who had degrees from England, oh. uh, from Oxford, from Edinburgh, and from uh, US universities. I did not know what UPenn, University of Pennsylvania meant at the time, uh, but nonetheless, uh, Professor Kem Tiwari was uh, a, a PhD from uh, U.S. was enough for me to uh, admire these professors. So this was a cosmopolitan place in that sense because the professors, many of the professors there had degrees, uh, their PhD degrees from uh, England and the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we were very, very happy about that. Of course, the, the educational system uh, limited our interaction with the professors. Uh, the educational system of uh, lecture followed by exam in two years, four hour exam, 10 four hour exams at the end of two years limited our interaction, intellectual interaction with the professors because there was no two way dialogue yeah. uh, between, between the professors and the students, but we didn't know that. We did not know that that could be possible. Uh, we inherited the system that it, there was and, and we, we went along with it. Um, at, at some point during our master's courses, we were asked to choose the last three, there were eight papers and we were asked to choose three papers, either three papers of linguistics or a, a thesis, as they said. And because I was exposed to many languages by the time, and it was just exams, no paper writing, which I didn't know. I hadn't written a single paper uh, in my uh, education up to the point. I didn't know what paper was, so I said, thesis would be a little too complicated thing for me. So I chose linguistics. And when, when I chose linguistics, then people, that's when I heard uh, more uh, seriously that uh, there was this person called uh, Professor K.M. Tiwari. He was a legend at the time, legend by his absence. He was absent, he, was all, he had already gone uh, to the Middle East somewhere. Uh, Iraq. Iraq. Iraq, uh, we knew that, uh, they talked about him, uh, but we, we were told that, oh, we wished there was Professor Kem Tiwari to teach us. And that feeling remained with us all through the time we took uh, linguistics classes. Uh, so we missed him, I missed him, we missed him very much, particularly students of linguistics, mm -hmm. uh, because we knew that he was like the other literature professors who had been trained uh, at uh, Cambridge or Oxford and, and Edinburgh, we, we, we thought that uh, he would have been equally uh, uh, beneficial to us uh, if he was, he was present. And then after that, uh, so, so there was this kind of a very interesting dynamic between uh, people who had gone through the system locally and had not seen, had not been trained outside, the, uh, outside India and then those who were trained like Professor Tiwari outside of India, uh, that, was, that, that, that feeling was there and, and we looked up, look, looked up to them. Uh, so, so, and then of course, later on, uh, Arunji became my colleague uh, in Nepal. We were there for a couple of years, I think, uh, together. And I got to know him uh, more. And then of course, through him, uh, I got to know about uh, Professor Tiwari more. And so 
so this has been a very wonderful occasion for me to, you know, uh, and know. So, so it's like a, it's like a, a, a clubbia, you know, the Mahavarta character, a clubbia, uh, who, who uh, worshiped the professor, the, his the guru in his absence, because the guru refused to uh, take him uh, as a student in person. In this case, however, uh, it was not the guru refusing the student, disciple, but the guru leaving the place and going somewhere else. And his, in his absence, we were inspired to learn about linguistics and, and so on. So that, that's the extent of my, uh, my knowledge and experience with Professor Tiwari. Okay, so thank you, uh, uh, Professor Mishra. Now I would like to request uh, my uh, speaker, hai, uh, jo Professor uh, Tarun Kumar, aap apna अगर वीडियो ऑन कर लें प्रोफेसर तरुण तो बेहतर होगा और अगर नहीं हो ऑन कर रहे हैं फिर भी कोई बात नहीं आप तरुण कुमार हमारे यहां पटना विश्वविद्यालय के हिंदी के विभाग अध्यक्ष हैं और इन्होंने पीएचडी किया है और काफी लंबे समय से पढ़ा रहे हैं यहां पर uh, इनकी दो किताबें हैं एक तो uh, अयोध्या प्रसाद हरियाद की की सारी कविताओं का इन्होंने कई खंड में uh, संपादन किया है और फिर uh, रामधारी सिंह दिनकर की कविताओं को एक जगह इकट्ठा करके इन्होंने संपादन किया है और इनकी अपनी भी किताबें हैं इन्होंने काफी लंबा समय दिया है uh, पठन पाठन और uh, लेखन और uh, शोध में और भाषा और साहित्य में इनकी गहरी पैठ है तो मैं चाहूँगा कि तरुण जी अपने विचार रखें और इस अवसर पर तिवारी जी के बारे में कुछ बताएं मेरी आवाज जा पा रही है बहुत अच्छी तरह से आपकी आवाज जा रही है चलिए आप अगर वीडियो में नहीं है तब भी कोई बात नहीं आप आवाज आपकी आ रही है और मुझे लगता है कि हम सभी हिंदी समझते हैं और हम कुछ हिंदी भी सुनेंगे प्रोफेसर कैराडोना से इसके बाद अरुण <laughs> जी वीडियो नहीं है वीडियो बंद है वीडियो आ, क्या दिक्कत आ, है क्या वीडियो में तरुण जी आवाज आ रही है आवाज आ रही है एकदम क्लियर आ रही है लेकिन आवाज आ पा रही है हाँ 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 वीडियो में क्या प्रॉब्लम है तरुण जी आप कर नहीं पा रहे हैं नीचे में देखिए ना एक कैमरे का चिन्ह होगा उसको टच करना होगा खाली हेलो आप अगर स्क्रीन को थोड़ा सा टच करेंगे तो नीचे बाई और कैमरा दिखेगा कैमरा और माइक दो जगह दोनों दिख रहा है क्या तरुण जी <laughs> तरुण जी आपकी आवाज तो आ रही है क्यों आप बंद कर रहे हैं तरुण जी अभी सुनाई नहीं पड़ रहा है लगता है कुछ नेटवर्क का इशू है ठीक है तो इस बीच में हम तब तक सर प्रोफेसर मिश्रा यू कैन आस्क अ क्वेश्चन आई कैन ऑल्सो आस्क टर्न बाय टर्न वी कैन आस्क Sure. So the first question uh, that I have uh, for Professor Professor Cardona is: uh, So when uh, Professor Tiwari uh, visited, hello. Ah, uh, Tiwari, uh, Tarun ji, आ गए. Tarun ji. हाँ, आवाज आ रही है आपकी. बोलिए, बोलिए. बोलिए. बोलना शुरू कर दीजिए. आवाज जा. ये आवाज जा रही है. हाँ, बिल्कुल. आप बोलना शुरू करें. तरुण जी आप आपको हमारी आवाज नहीं आ रही क्या आ, नहीं इनका माइक ऑफ है आप देख लीजिए ना माइक भी ऑफ है माइक नहीं है तो माइक का साइन भी नहीं है माइक का साइन भी नहीं है हाँ मतलब माइक ऑफ है तो फिर रहने देते हैं फिर आप शुरू कर दें 
So, so, so my, my question to you, uh, sir, is uh, so when he visited you in rural Balia, what was the year that was, uh, and uh, why did you pursue this rural pundit who knew neither Hindi nor English, most likely probably some version of uh, Bhojpuri or Avadi? How, what made you go to, to, to this rural place uh, oh, well, and what are you doing? Okay, Raghunath Sharma first taught at the Sanskrit University in Varanasi. Kashi Vidyapit. But Kashi. then, no, no, then it, no, it was not the Sanskrit Vidyapit. That's a separate institution. Kashi, Kashi, Kashi Vidyapit. Not the Kashi Vidyapit. No. It was the Sanskrit Vishwavidyale. First, it was known as the King's College. Then it was known as the, uh, I forget what the name was, okay. but it's now the, uh, simply called the Varanaseya Sanskrit Vidya. Which Vidya. 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 Hmm. That's all. And he was professor there for many years. He was actually the head of the Vedanta department but he was a very famous grammarian. He and his father, Kashinath Shastri, had together edited uh, the Mahabhashya in the Nirnaya Sagara Press edition. And if you ever look at it in the second edition, you will see that at the bottom there are little footnotes and in parentheses, it says Rana, and that is Raghunatha. Now, those are his notes. So he, he was a very famous scholar, and he had written a, composed a commentary on the Vakya Padiya. I don't, for, for those of you who don't know, the Vakya Padiya is the most famous work in Sanskrit on philosophy of language from the fifth, from the fourth century AD. It is a very difficult text. It, it runs to thousands of shlokas and, it, it, and it's commentary. And, oh. Tarunji, swagat hai aapka. So please go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead, sir. Go ahead. So he composed a commentary called Amba Kartri. Amba Kartri means Amba Eva Kartri Naham. Amba, he was a great, he was a worshipper of of Amba in Eastern Bihar, in Eastern UP. And uh, he was very famous and uh, that work, I, I studied it with him for many years. I, I can honestly say that I've read the entire Vakya Padilla with the commentaries and his commentary. And that's what we used to get up in the morning to discuss the problems in there. So I went first to Varanasi, and then when he retired, he went back to his ancestral village, Chata, which was founded by his ancestors in the 14th century. Actually, it's not Chata. Chata is the postal address. The name of the village is Semri, because of this tree. Simri, yeah. Simmer, simmer, and, uh, mm -hmm. So that's the reason I went there. And he said, well, come along with me to the village. And sir, I went. Sir, my question so, so, is, okay. Well, 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 follow-up question, just, just uh, you yeah. know, let me, let me finish that question. So the follow-up question then is, on the one hand, you see uh, uh, Pandit Raghunath uh, going back sir, to his village after his tenure, uh, a professional life career in Varanasi. And then on the other hand, you see Professor Tiwari 
visiting you in the village and was really surprised to see you in living in such rural condition. And you also mentioned that uh, in the city, when you visited Patna, Professor Tiwari put you up with one of his wealthy uh, friends. Uh, what do you think of the dichotomy, the rural city dichotomy in India? Because you have studied Sanskrit and, and you visited, I'm, I'm, I suppose, uh, more than one rural settings and also the cities. How do you view that uh, in, the, in the Indian context? Uh, Professor Tiwari's, uh, you know, like he didn't, he never addressed you by your first name, which is a well, common thing. That, that doesn't surprise me. Look, you have to understand, I come from a, a Spanish culture. My mother tongue is Spanish. I see. Not English. So I come from a Spanish culture where uh, we're very, very uh, deferential and uh, we treat elders with high respect. Uh, I still remember my younger brother addressing an uncle and he used the pronoun tu, which is like Hindi tu. And my, some, my, and my, I, think, I don't remember whether my father and my mother slapped him. He says, you call him usted, which is up. Exactly. That is, you must use so that, and, and I, I, I am very formal. I mean, people say I'm very cold, but until I've known somebody for a very long time, I don't feel that I can address them by their first name or anything like that. So in that respect, Tibari and I got along fine. We were equally the same sort of feeling towards how you deal with people. So now, that was his feeling, I suspect uh, he lived in, I don't know, I don't know what, where he lived just before he died, but he lived in, in a rather modest apartment. It was fine, you know. He did not have a, a, a bungalow or anything like that. His, 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 the, the home of his friend where he put me up was a large bungalow. One of these very fancy uh, homes with servants and so that it was a very different uh, but at the same time that friend uh, treated Pivari with great respect I mean it was not that I am rich and you are poor or anything like that it was that uh, we are friends and I am happy to do you a favor so that that's it was just that Pivari felt that one, I should not stay in a hotel. That would be an insult. Two, that I should, I could not stay in his apartment. There was not enough room. So they put me up with his friend. <clears throat> Sir, you're, uh, uh, you've already mentioned the common element between the Indian and the Spanish culture, I think. Very interesting. I. Uh, do you also uh, recall the, or you have some memories of Patna, I think you say? Oh, yes, it... yes. I, I visited with, I mean, the, the only time I spent, uh, I spent about a, a week and a half there. Week and a half, okay. 10 days. And the main purpose was to go to the, uh, with, Tivari was helping me to go to the library to get these manuscripts. Was, was, it, was, it, was it Khuda Bakhs library? Khuda Bakhs library? No. no, I don't remember. It was just the university library. Okay, university library must be. Must yeah, be. yeah, the central university library, the University ah. of Patna library. It used to be a rich library. Oh, it, it was. At that time. a very not, good collection of manuscripts. Not now. Not, not very well tended. They didn't mm -hmm. take care of their materials. Yeah. But then this is a problem throughout India. The, the, the libraries are in very poor shape. Okay. So, so my second question uh, is uh, then, so Professor Tiwari came from uh, English studies background. Mm. 
Uh, he went to study uh, at UPenn from an English study background. How did he then come to you who was an Indologist or Sanskritist, South Asianist to study uh, what he studied? Okay. See, what was I the led, I, Yeah. I led a, 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 a kind of a split personality at the university. See, I was first appointed in the Department of South Asian Studies in 1960. That department was so, so politically people fighting with each other. <laughs> the anthropologists, the historians, the, uh, the traditional philologists, they were constantly arguing with each other. So in 1965, Berkeley made me an offer. They said, we'll offer you an, an associate professorship uh, if you will come to Berkeley. And the chairman of the, Center of the linguistics department said, well, don't go to Berkeley, come to my department. It's a nice small department. There were only five people in it. It was a small group of people who got along very well. So I said, yes, marvelous. And the, the agreement was that I could teach anything I wanted, that I would have no restrictions placed on my teaching, uh, what, I, what I taught. And since I, would, I was then an associate professor with tenure, uh, it was a very good existence. So I was in the linguistics department, but I, all my work was still in, in Indic. And that's the way it was. And, and uh, Tivadi worked with me in the linguistics department while studying these uh, Sanskrit works. Several other students did too. Uh, most of my students, uh, Many of my uh, PhDs were, were Indian. Uh, Tivari was the first. Then two years later was um, uh, Dayashankar Joshi from the Gujarat who did a dissertation on Tadhita Deravits. Then uh, there was um, Let's see, who was it? Vijaya was her first name. I can't remember her last name. And then uh, several others uh, who worked in the linguistics department were, well, Madho um, Deshpande uh, and Jayashri Gune. They were pure Sanskrits. They were not even in linguistics. They were pure Sanskritists from Pune who had gotten Bhatshala education, who spoke fluent Sanskrit and could compose in Sanskrit. So with them, it was like being in India. And, but it was in the linguistics department. So the, 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 the arrangement was a very personal one that I, as a member of the linguistics department was given this total freedom to teach what I wanted. And I kept contact with the other Indologists in the Oriental Studies department. But I said, I will not set foot in that department. I called it a Byzantine net of iniquity. They were always fighting with each other. Yes. And it became worse with the Israeli Arab contrast come conflict because in oriental studies they also taught arabic studies and 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 uh, hebrew studies so i said no and that's why tibari worked in the linguistics department with me on this topic okay thank you uh, let me share right now with you sir that he uh, while he was teaching in uh, the republic of yemen he, he had got interested in arabic uh, quite a bit Yes. And uh, he had a plan to write uh, an Arabic English dictionary. 
but somehow it didn't happen. But he did write uh, quite a few articles uh, on the loan words of Arabic and Hindi or other things, uh, <laughs> which got published in Yemen Times there in uh, Yemen and all that. Oh. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I would like to ask you, how got, uh, did you get interested in Hindi? And I think you taught Hindi in your university. Well, you see, if you live in India. Sir, you can tell Hindi in Hindi, then it will be good. मैं तो भारत में रहता था बड़ी शहरों में नहीं गांव में और गांव में इंग्लिश नहीं बोलते हिंदी ही बोलते हैं ये बात सही है इसलिए हिंदी सीखा और सिखाया भी हाँ सिखाया भी तो आपने हिंदी हिंदी केवल भाषा ही से में आपने काम किया या पढ़ाया कुछ साहित्य में भी आपकी रुचि हुई साहित्य में नहीं साहित्य तो पढ़ा है लेकिन उसके बारे में कुछ नहीं लिखा क्योंकि संस्कृत अगर आपने पढ़ा है और उसका गहन अध्ययन किया है फिर तो हिंदी मैं बोलना और हिंदी समझना और हिंदी के बारे में जानकारी होना आश्चर्य की बात नहीं है आपने आपने तो कई और भाषाओं का आपको ज्ञान है मतलब भारतीय इंडो यूरोपियन फैमिली की कई और भाषा इंडो ईरानियन फैमिली और वॉट अब पता नहीं क्या 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 और नाम है उसके अच्छा तो गुजराती जानता हूँ सो ते गुजराती आवे छे गुजराती आवे छे हाँ so professor one more question for you so um you you got interested in south asian sanskrit or south asian studies um question a one how did you get interested in the first place you were you were very young you said that you you joined u pen when you were 24 years old okay that uh, was in you, you this was one that I met somebody and got interested. He was a friend at, at, at Yale, right. where I did my my degree. Okay, so so you're you're very young when you got interested in in South Asian uh, yeah yeah Sanskrit or Sanskrit. And question two is, uh, given what we have heard from you and my understanding of uh, overseas scholars studying, particularly Sanskrit and interacting with. Sanskrit scholars in rural settings, looking for manuscripts and so forth. Uh, do you think that there is a need for a history of literature, a history of literature uh, of the India, of, 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 of Sanskrit <clears throat> um, written by, I, I don't know if it already exists, I have seen writing about on, on Hindus or things like that, but not this uh, extensive because India, you, you mentioned you yourself studied in UP, Bihar, and you went to Gujarat, you went to uh, other places, uh, Tam, uh, Chennai, uh, Tam, uh, you know, Madras, that these, these isolated uh, studies or pockets of Sanskrit studies, I, as far as I know, within India, they're not connected to each other. They don't even know each other. People study themselves and the system in India is such educational system is that uh, there isn't much kind of very organic interaction within within India. So so do you think that there is a need for- well, there, there, there is some of... interaction. The UGC has sponsored seminars mm -hmm. and on the occasion of one of the World Sanskrit Conferences, there was a, uh, a book, a small book published in which you had chapters, uh, Sanskrit in Bengal, Sanskrit in Gujarat, Sanskrit in UP, Sanskrit in Kerala, Sanskrit in etc. And you give a brief kind of history of the contribution 
of that area to Sanskrit studies and Indic studies. Now, an attempt at integrating them, no, I don't know that. There's never really been any attempt at integrating. There's a, there's a great deal of difficulty. I wrote a book, it, it was published in 1976, called Panini, A Survey of Research. And I covered work that had been done in English, French, German, Dutch, Italian, uh, then Sanskrit, Hindi, Gujarati, and Bengali. And it occurred to me, most Indian scholars, no matter how learned they are, of the post-British era, do not know any European language well enough. Mm -hmm. They don't know German, French, those languages to really understand uh, studies. And most Europeans until quite recently didn't know any Indian language, except if they were studying Sanskrit, they knew Sanskrit, that's it. More, not more, yeah. But since the 1970s or so, or 60s, there has been more of an effort. Uh, how much of it is really uh, a true interaction is hard to tell. I, I can't, I don't know. Uh, but there has been interaction. For example, there's the, you're, you're, you work, you're Nepali. There's been the, you, the German commission uh, uh, on Nepal that, that, that sponsored a complete cataloging of all the Sanskrit manuscripts in the library, in the libraries in Nepal. And there are microfilms all of, this, of all of this in Europe and in Nepal itself. The French, uh, of course, have Pondicherry uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in Tamil, in Tamil Nadu. And, but that's, that's one of the most interesting um, phenomena. I don't know if you've been there. Pondicherry, or I don't know how it's anglicized. Uh, you go there and there's this small area and you might as well be in a French village because everybody speaks French. The food is French until you leave that perimeter. And then all of a sudden you have South Indian cooking <laughs> and Tamil is spoken so that the interaction there, there is some interaction, but it's kind of that the, the, the Indian scholar helps the European. Mm. And there's still this feeling that you must not be one of them. That is a European remains a European. I see. So, so there's a kind of a wall between the two, I think. And, but you see, I feel that's terrible. Mm, of course. You cannot really understand the Sanskrit works unless you feel them from inside. So let me, let me then, let me then uh, ask you a subsequent uh, addition to the, to the question that I asked. So I, I studied Sanskrit from uh, class six through my BA in college. Oh. So I had, I had B English honors and then I had Sanskrit as my uh, side subject. So I studied Sanskrit quite, uh, you know, for 10 years through okay. college, all through four years of college. And I have always wondered, um, given how rich the literature has been, even from your conversation, it's very clear that uh, all over India, there are uh, very rich pockets of Sanskrit scholars, archives, and so on. And I've always wondered why is it that uh, Sanskrit, which is not just uh, an ancient language like Latin or Greek, um, but is 
at the at the heart and soul of Indian culture, in terms of the re religion, philosophy, literature, and, and so forth, languages. Um, why has Sanskrit been uh, neglected? Is not widespread in terms of its instruction. For example, I studied Sanskrit for ten years, and I I I would say that I was never taught the language. We would we would study the translations of various texts from Panchatantra to, to Meghudutam and Siddhva uh, Vigyan Sakultalam and, and, and so on, um, but not the language. Uh, we, we were not able to, I couldn't, so after I finished my B, I couldn't speak Sanskrit. Um, and, and so Sanskrit is not popular. There are a lot of resistance to Sanskrit. Do you think that this, this resistance of the Sanskritists, Indian Sanskritists, pundits, uh, uh, in terms of the Europeans, exists in terms of the, the other people also uh, within India? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> uh, let's look at it this way. You say, yes, and, and, and this can be a terribly shattering experience. I had a student come to me from the University of Bombay. It was maybe 30 years ago. Charming young lady. She came with a first, first class degree in Sanskrit. She had, read, she had uh, won a gold medal. And she said, I'm interested in working with you. I said, yes, well, OK. Given your background, there's some very interesting work on the interaction between Nyaya, logic, and Vyakarana, grammar, in India. So I suggest to you that we, we work on a 13th to 14th century, maybe even 12th century, text called the Tattva Chintamani. Now the Tattva Chintamani has a section that is called the, the, the Shabda Khanda on speech. And it deals with grammatical issues. But it's a very tough text to understand. And the commentaries are even harder. So I started to read it with her. Well, she could, of course, read the text beautifully with a, an excellent Marathi pronunciation. Uh, but she could not tell me what the text meant. Mm. So I said to her, well, let's do it in Sanskrit. First, you give me the Pada Cheda, then you give me the Anvaya, then you give me the Vivarana. That is, you first split, a, split the words, then you give me the syntactic connection, and then you give me a paraphrase. She couldn't do this. So finally, I said to her, dear young, dear young lady, <laughs> please go work with someone else. So she, she stopped. We remain good friends. She writes me on my birthday every year. And we're, she, she still remains a good friend. And she's married with children and very happy now. So, but that, that is the situation that they read translations. Mm -hmm. That right. is, they read a difficult text. But they don't, they don't struggle with the actual Sanskrit. They, they read the, the translation. Sir, I have uh, something to add here. Uh, in 2019, when I was interviewing uh, Professor Tiwari, I had asked him a question, sir, how was your initial experience of uh, being there in the US? So he told me, he did not say many things, but uh, he gave me two anecdotes. He said uh, that uh, one of the professors from Patna University, he was the principal of uh, Patna Law College, Professor Deshpande, if I recall, that was the name. He was on a visit to the University of Pennsylvania when Professor Tiwari was a student there. And he was working under you on Panini. So when Professor Tiwari came to know that there is a person from India, not just from India, but also from Patna University, where he was also a lecturer, so he was very keen to meet him. He went and met him 
professor desh pande was a senior person so uh, he said sir uh, i am a student here and uh, i i came to know that you have come on a visit uh, then he said what are you doing here he said i am uh, doing phd on uh, panini's grammar then he said oh you are doing something like that on panini's grammar so how long have you studied san sanskrit he said before this i had not uh, read sanskrit uh, in fact i did not have uh, much idea about uh, sanskrit i mean formal uh, learning i did not have then he said how dare you study sanskrit here unless you have studied sanskrit for 12 years you should not have uh, you know decided to take panini you have not read sanskrit earlier and you have decided to do phd on him in fact he had come from a particular background or the community which considers uh, sanskrit as their own asset and you know better than that i would not name that uh, you know name and all i'll not give i think so <laughs> then later he also gave another anecdote about professor uh, desh pande in fact he said uh, uh, i don't know whether you or some other professor they were uh, sitting along with him over uh, lunch and suddenly they saw that professor desh pande uh, took out the bowl uh, the bowl in which he was uh, taking something breakfast or lunch and then he moved to another table where there was no person sitting he went there alone so the other professors they felt uh, very odd about that because they didn't understand what had happened but and then they also saw that they he left them and he moved to another table late and then later when he under, they understood they felt very offended they felt like you know being untouchables kind of Uh, so Good that job. was that was uh, the other. I don't know. I should have taken the name or not, but well, no. This is this is not an uncommon reaction. In nineteen, I forget when it was exactly in the late nineteen hundreds, nineteen eighty five or ninety. The World Sanskrit Conference met in Pennsylvania. and there was a large indian delegation and some of them were very traditional uh, some of them i knew but some of them were very very traditional and they 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 went to a restaurant and they said well we want vegetarian food they said fine we'll give you vegetarian food but then they were highly insulted and got angry because other people were eating meat so i explained to them you see look this is not a purely vegetarian restaurant and you have to understand that these are not vegetarian indians they're not hindus so why do you insist that they not eat meat but they said no why should they be allowed to eat meat i said well come with me i'll take you to a place where not a there is no meat eaten pure vegetarian uh it's it's a your mind has to be open and some people okay have difficulty in opening their minds it's what can you do All right professor misra you have any question yeah so finally i would say that you know it looks like uh, we are commemorating uh, professor tiwari's memory his life um it seems to me that is a kind of a we have come to a full circle uh uh you went to study in india you studied in several places you studied sanskrit you're a scholar of sanskrit uh, language uh its various aspects and then professor tiwari from a from a provincial a uh, university in india went to study Uh, to to you pen under you uh, so so it's kind of a you know circle of of it's, learning and scholarship it's a very fine example of exchange. of exchange of knowledge and uh, and 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 so so i think that there there needs to be a history written about this exchange of people who come to the west 
to study Sanskrit. I, I, I was, when I was in college, I studying Sanskrit, uh, one of my professors there very frequently visited uh, uh, the US and Germany uh, to give papers. Uh, and so I think that this exchange of uh, scholarship between India, particularly the, the Sanskritic scholarship, that needs to be recorded because without uh, having a written uh, history of it, yes, this it experience will disappear, right? That, that, that history will disappear. Very, that would be a very good thing. Yes, yes, I agree. Part of the, I mean, one of the, the horrible things that's happening, I don't know if you're acquainted with what's happening, is that universities in Europe and the Western Hemisphere in the United States, Canada, South America, little by little is simply eliminating all of these studies. Right, right. Just a few days ago, I signed a petition for the university at, at Halle in Germany, asking that they not eliminate all of these studies. Yeah. They, they've eliminated two professorships in Sanskrit. They're gone. Mm. Now you understand in Holland, which used to be one of the centers of, of, of Sanskrit studies, there's only one place that still has a professorship in Sanskrit and that is Leiden, L-E-I-T-E-N. Leiden, yeah. In England, only Oxford has a professor of Sanskrit, only Oxford. Elsewhere, they're just eliminating these positions because they say, they're not modern, they're not useful. The criteria yeah. have changed. Mm -hmm. That is the, the notion of studying a culture for its own sake, of studying the language and the literature is slowly disappearing. And it's, it's even happening for Greek and Latin and, and for, for the West right. after all, that's a Greek and Latin basis mm -hmm. of the culture. It's even happening there. In India, it's not happening. In India, on the contrary, the problem there is that there are more and more Sanskrit universities found established and they're funded by the UGC. Uh, the problem there is maintaining quality control, getting good people right. to be there. But I agree that, yes, it would be very nice to have somebody, a historian who's a, acquainted with all of these areas, come in, whether he be Indian or European, it doesn't matter, who can bridge and explain how these things all developed over the years without, and this is important, without prejudice. Right. Right, so we have to uh, understand uh, the cultures on their own grounds. So uh, I, I would like to ask you probably the last question. Uh, what is the present work of your study? Oh, I am, I hope to live to over a hundred because I know. <laughs> I'm working on a large work called Panini, his work and its traditions. And I'm, I'm now on volume 3.4. Uh, which is now 900 pages long. And I hope to finish it this year. Oh. And the projection is to have eight volumes. There's, it's the Ashtad so there will be eight volumes covering the work. Oh, great. So uh, I had a colleague, his name was Murray Emano, who was my senior colleague at the University of California in Berkeley. He lived to 105. And the day before he died in his sleep, he finished proofreading his last article. So uh, this is what keeps me going. I just celebrated my 85th birthday. And uh, this is what keeps me going. I'm, I have to finish my work. I'm sure you would uh, live beyond even her. I think uh, you would live uh, 10, 120, sir. Who knows? So who knows? We live day to day. All your work. Case, I get up happy to be here. 
and happy to read my work. And I still teach by Zoom. I have classes on Friday morning and on Sunday morning. Oh, great. So I still have students from actually from all over who want to work with me and they and they study with me and it's it's very good. I I, I keep in touch with with people that way. Right, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Well, it was a so pleasure gonna, to be with you, and I'm Professor glad. Cardona, I would I would ask for a privilege to be in touch with you. I'll I'll get in touch with you if I have any questions about uh, any anything related. Oh, do to... please! I welcome. Yes, please do. You have my email address, right? And I even have my telephone numbers. <laughs> Arunji has them. Yeah, yeah. So it was very nice. It was a pleasure to be with you. Right. And sir. thank you for the invitation. Right, and sir. Was, thank you. I, I'm very happy to have celebrated Tiwari Ji's life. Well, thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you so much. Namaste. namaste. Everyone, namaste. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Anuji, it was a wonderful event you organized. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And uh, Hamara, uh, you can end the Facebook thing. Plan, plan, Hamara Rakta, eight minute, my Facebook co pale off Kartan. Eight minute, yeah, pay. Top live stream. Or hum recording we off Kartan. My recording, Kartan.